Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Panu Miettinen, and I welcome you all to our panel discussion about the future of vertical farming. And this event is a part of Alta University's Design for a Cooler Planet Festival, which runs for another week. So you can check it out on Alta websites. And I will be hosting this event with Titta Kotilainen from Luke. So a couple of words about myself first. So I have been involved in the technology development in the field of vertical farming for the last five years. And it's been quite a ride. When I started, vertical farming was still kind of a niche market that was quite unfamiliar to most of, most of the people. But now it's really moving towards a globally recognized solution for our food crisis. And I have been involved in different projects at Aalto University and Luke. And I am also a co-founder in Vacuum Insulation Solutions, which is a startup that focuses on building the most sustainable and efficient vertical farming buildings. So before I let Titta talk, uh, there is a couple of words about today's program. So we will start off by listening to six presentations. And uh, they come from different experts on the field. And after the presentations, we will have a panel discussion here with uh, four panelists, and me and Tita will be moderating. So yeah, I welcome you all again, and I hope you enjoy this event. All right. So I will start today's presentations by giving you an introduction, a very short of why we are, what we are talking about here today. So very briefly, because beloved child has many names. You can call it controlled environment agriculture, vertical farming, plant factories, plant factories with artificial lighting, etc., etc. So in short, uh, what we uh, our topic today uh, is growing plants food in controlled conditions where usually there's no sunlight involved. So the whole uh, technological development of vertical farming has been made possible by the advancement of LED lights. So like 20 years ago with greenhouses, you had only available uh, these hypersodium lights that you can't use very close to the plants. Hence, it's not practical to design a um, closed environment where plants are stacked on shelves on top of another with those kind of uh, lighting fixtures. But with LEDs, the situation is really different. So despite the many names, uh, we sum up everything under uh, vertical farming here today. So now I will uh, briefly introduce uh, some of our research projects that I'm involved in uh, at our research institute, Natural Resources Institute Finland. There are some many more that I didn't include here, so that I, but to give you a brief, brief introduction. So we'll start with the research facility that is located in Kajaani in northern Finland. Um, it's built in the premises of uh, Kainu Vocational College. And uh, the aim is to study this and develop year-round energy efficient and economically profitable horticultural production in northern Finland, because Kajaani is so north that basically that's the uh, in terms of viability, it's no point building greenhouses any more northern uh, uh, in Finland. Uh, it would take just too much energy to warm them up during the winter. But this type of vertical farming, uh, of course, it works anywhere. So there, there have been a lot of experiments with different types of plants. And just as, as an example, to mention uh, seedlings, a uh, lot of seedlings that are grown then to full grown plants here in Finland in uh, open field for production like strawberries or cabbage etc. Uh, those seedlings come from, for example, from Poland and the Netherlands. And there have been questions that what if we could more and more grow those seedlings indoors here in Finland? Because there's always the problem of uh, plant diseases traveling with the seedlings etc. etc. And of course, the energy uh, consumption side of things, that's a big part of the what's been examined in that facility. And we will hear a lot about uh, energy issues later on today. 
So um, Panu mentioned this uh, vacuum insulation system, uh, and we have this pilot facility at our institute uh, research station in Piikkiö near Turku, and that has been used already to uh, grow lettuce, and we will continue working in that that vertical farming research facility later on this autumn. And uh, then we have this, uh, what we call cucumber factory, because um, as you will learn during today, most of the plants nowadays grown in vertical farming environments are like small plants. You imagine lettuces and herbs uh, in pots. And then uh, my colleagues, already years ago uh, started to think that because cucumbers when they grow in uh, greenhouses they can be something like four or five meters tall and usually they only have the top light just there on the top that what about the leaves lower on the plant that how much light reaches those leaves and what about the photosynthesis of those leaves uh, below so they put the cucumber plants sideways and put the lights there to study photosynthesis. But then they, they, uh, some years later, they started to think that, hmm, actually this idea might work in this vertical farming concept. Hence, now there's a patent accepted. Uh, we have grown uh, cucumbers, pole beans and hops quite successfully in this type of system. And there's a business model in development. And like I said, uh, we will talk a lot about energy and electricity prices today. And just to mention uh, experiments that we've been doing in this Food Without Fields project is that uh, if you take the electricity price and adjust your lighting regime according to those electricity prices, of course, uh, in a way it's straightforward. You can control and program your lights to do that. But the lettuces didn't like that. They they actually really really didn't like that. We disturbed their uh, circadian rhythm so much that uh, we are continuing now with the experiments. Also, uh, one of our speakers, Arto Mäkinen, will tell you about this type of experiment just after me. That uh, what one needs to do to sort of smooth the transitions. What can we do? to make the plants sort of accept that elect electricity prices vary a lot so that the lighting regimes might vary a lot. And then just last, uh, this I want to mention this Digitonku project that has been going on uh, in the Nerbio region in Finland. Uh, it hasn't been strictly about vertical farming, but greenhouse production. But the concept that has been developed there and also, of course, elsewhere, uh, what I like to promote in our research is that the plants would tell us what they need, because uh, usually the climate control programs uh, that control the climate in greenhouses and vertical farms, they measure air temperature or air humidity or something like that. But what about if it would measure leaf temperature? And uh, in this case, where the pictures sap flow in tomato stems, that what a, what if the uh, climate control would be steered from the plant perspective. So that's that's the sort of uh, one big thing that uh, we keep in mind with our pro project, that how to get towards the situation that the plants would tell what they need. And that gives me a, a perfect way to introduce our next speaker, Arto Mäkinen, a PhD student from University of Helsinki, and he has this similar approach in his studies. So please, Artu, if you can. I think Artu made it. Just a minute for the online audience, we're changing laptops. <laughs>
Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Artu Mäkinen. I'm a PhD student uh, in the doctoral program of plant science at the University of Helsinki. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of the th things I'm studying in my PhD project. And uh, the title of the thesis is Dynamic Control Strategies of Artificial Light and Vertical Farming, in which I aim to find uh, the goal of the thesis is to find a balance between the use of electricity consumption and crop, crop productivity. And uh, as many of you know, or all of you know, the erratic fluctuations of electricity price has been on the news recently. And this year, uh, it's been quite dramatic changes throughout the summer and uh, throughout the year. And uh, Here's a few, few news articles from the Finnish uh, newspaper Helsingin Sanomat. Uh, apologies that they are in Finnish, but I try to translate them into English as much as possible. So there have been some practical applications for households, which can be used to alleviate these kind of like uh, drastic uh, fluctuations in electricity price by uh, utilizing uh, control systems, which can uh, allocate electricity consumption into hours of the day which in which the electricity price is lower and um, yeah this is the household perspective but in terms of um, commercial greenhouse production and uh, plant production in general uh, the order of magnitude in greenhouse production is significantly larger. Uh, the electricity consumption is measured in megawatt hours instead of kilowatt hours. And uh, in northern latitudes, in greenhouse, greenhouse production is uh, quite volatile and subjective to uh, uh, fluctuation in available solar, solar light. There can be too much or there can be too little to uh, alleviate this. The farmers use uh, supplemental lights and traditionally, that has been HBS lights, which you can see in the picture, picture below. Uh, vertical farming, on the other hand, is a type of cultivation technique where the system in, as a whole is highly optimized and enclosed from the uh, nature, natural elements and uh, is functioning in, independently of natural light. In these types of systems, the arti use of artificial light typically covers 70 to 80 percent of electricity consumption or costs and uh, 20 to 30 percent of overall production costs. So the use of artificial light slash electricity is directly influencing the production efficiency of these highly advanced indoor cultivation systems. And uh, let's look at the traditional or conventional way of like how greenhouse farmers are organizing their or like managing their lighting strategies in uh, in the high latitudes. So here you can see uh, a diagram of sun sunlight intensity changing throughout the day. It's quite a small font, but on the bottom there's x-axis, which is like 24 hour cycle of the day. And on the y-axis there, there's the light intensity. So there's like um, daily changes in light intensity as the sun, sun is transitioning past the sky. But there can also be changes in the weather, for example, for example, cloud cover or uh, seasonal changes where this graph would be or the line would be totally flat. There would be no light, natural light all, at all. So what the growers do is they use supplemental light. They use HPS lights, which can be uh, switched on or off. So there's not much really control over how much light they can provide to the plants apart from switching them on or off. And um, when you look at the um, changes in the electricity price throughout the day, here's the electricity price curve is calculated using uh, North Pool data from the years 2020 and 2021. It's a uh, calculated average between, between every day and every single hourly hourly well, hourly data from these years. So it should be relatively robust. It's not taking into consideration the recent years and the uh, changes in like uh, dramatic fluctuations. 
or it could be quite, like should be quite robust. On the other hand, in vertical farming, where you are uh, not depending on dependent on solar light, you can organize these lighting regimes differently. Uh, by using LED technology, you can dim the lights uh, quite easily, and uh, they can be dimmed from 10% to 100%. So using that te technique, you could organize or develop a lighting strategy which, which would change the light intensity, for example, uh, have a high peak in the middle of the night and then lower the light intensity as the electricity price starts to uh, increase in the morning. Or you could have it uh, the opposite way of like uh, having starting out with a low, low light intensity and uh, switching up into a higher intensity towards the night. Uh, these lighting strategies should be or can be organized so that the light, like the plants, get sufficient amount of light in order to grow and develop into mature plants. So the main objectives of my PhD project uh, what is to uh, design and construct a small-scale vertical farming system, which can be uh, or equipped with these kind of like uh, adjustable LED lights and use the system to investigate different photobiological responses in plants under these uh, alternative lighting regime conditions. Um, we are using a translational approach, which means that we are trying to transfer knowledge and insights gained from basic uh, biological studies into more relevant and important food crop species. Uh, in these studies, we're starting out with uh, basic lettuce and kale, and uh, in the future, we hope to use some other uh, interesting species as well. We are also yeah, well, observing their growth, yield, and nutritional value, which are like key components of like uh, plant production for food food purposes uh, in this context. So, and we are also employing a applied approach, in we, meaning that we aim to develop alternative lighting strategies for commercial use, especially in vertical farming. So uh, the first objective is actually quite well underway already. I have put a small small scale system up at the University of Helsinki facilities. And the name comes, the name Valke comes from a Finnish acronym Valon ja Sähköenergian älykäskäyttö kerrosviljelyssä, which roughly translates to intelligent use of artificial light and electricity in vertical farming. Uh, the system is constructed within a walking growth chamber room with uh, controlled conditions for uh, air temperature and relative humidity. It is also equipped with a programmable LED control system, which enables me to control the photo period or the day length uh, light intensity levels, levels within that uh, photo period, and also introduce some light fluctuations if I want to. We also aim to uh, study, um, well, we, we aim, aim to study and investigate the effects of these alternative lighting regimes but also try out different cultivation methods, for example, hydroponics and aeroponics. And uh, we also have access to different uh, light spectra and uh, we can swap out different, different lamps for, for the system if we please to. So here's a closer look of the system. You can see four compartments on four shelves, which are separated by uh, the, these reflective sheets, which help block out the light, but also greatly enhance the light distribution within each each chamber. And uh, on each shelf, there's one single LED LED lamp installed. And next, here's a diagram of how the uh, system is being controlled and how it's connected together. So on the bottom, you see uh, the same shelves as in the earlier picture. And each of the LED light is connected into a, its separate dimmer. And the, those dimmers are controlled by an access point, which in turn is connected to the internet and can be controlled and programmed by a, a mobile app uh, on your phone or on a browser, browser dashboard. <clears throat> and uh, what I've come up with uh, for treatments of this thing is uh, we're starting out with four different lighting regime treatments. Uh, the one on the left uh, top is uh, 
this control treatment, which corresponds to a typical lighting regime, which is used in commercial greenhouse production or vertical farming. The lights are switched on roughly in the morning and they stay remain on at the fixed uh, light intensity throughout the day, typically between like uh, 16 to 18 hours each day. The one on the right uh, aims to mimic the light intensity changes uh, that occur in a natural outdoor lighting environment. And the two on the bottom um, can be used to investigate the effects of like this. What if the um, light intensity peak starts out early in the morning and then smooths out throughout the day or vice versa, uh, so starts out with a low intensity and then ends with a high intensity. This can be, uh, this can influence a wide variety of like qualitative uh, like um, attributes of the plants, but also like general growth. And all of these uh, lighting treatments uh, have the same amount of light. So the term for that in a uh, hort horticultural uh, setting is called DLI, which is daily light integral. Uh, some preliminary experiments show that there were no significant differences in uh, fresh weight in lettuce between these treatments, which in this context is, is a good thing. So which means that we can possibly use these to uh, save some electricity. And uh, but we need to kind of like, uh, make some more thorough experiments to confirm these results. We have also yet to uh, delve deeper into the qualitative aspects of this, but uh, that will come at a later date. And based on the same North Pole data uh, I showed you earlier in the previous graphs, I estimated that it could be possible to save up to 20 or 30 percent uh, costs in electricity with these kind of regimes compared to the control treatment. So to conclude, uh, it's about finding a balance between these two things. So LED can can be used to uh, achieve dynamic control of the light in a like a variety of ways. For example, you can easily adjust the duration of the day, day length, but also the quality of the quality of the light, the spectrum. And also, most importantly, the quantity and the bright brightness or the intensity throughout the day is uh, also able to able to manipulate. And these these terms are essential in meeting the needs of the, of the plant uh, throughout its, its growth changing stages. But also, it has uh, interesting opportunities for op optimizing the electricity consumption in these kind of systems. And in my PhD project, I aim to overlap these these aspects and uh, find some practical solutions in terms of intelligence light, light use. Thank you. Here's some uh, acknowledgments. Go to my research group and also my Yuan Uriorikalan Putaransatia, which are sponsoring uh, the studies for the next year of my studies. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. It was a really interesting presentation and it sounds like 30% savings in electricity cost is quite a lot these days. <laughs> and just to note the, the audience, uh, we will take questions at the end of the panel. So if you have a specific question in mind, please write it down in the chat or somewhere else and we can then take them at one part in the, in the end section. And so our next speaker is the CEO of NetLED, Nico, Nico Kivioja. So I will put up the laptop and let you present. Sure. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I believe most of you already know what NetLED is, but briefly. Briefly, we are a um, Pirkkala, Pirkanmaa-based technology company, and we build and um, offer turnkey vertical farming systems for mass producers of vegetables. And uh, we've uh, built about 10 vertical farms so far, and the biggest one we just commissioned this summer in, in Sweden, in Sjöreforce, where we have 2.7 million heads of herbs annually produced in that facility. And that is being marketed. Those crops are being marketed with ICA, which is the local Kesko group. 
with their own private label brand. So that is the that is the, the biggest project we've done so far. So but that's Netlet in brief. Um, I was asked to give a little, let's say, outlook or introduction to how we see the overall vertical farming market right now from technology point of view, but also from the actual value chain point of view. So if you think about the value chain, it comes from the both the, the actual um, produce, the leafy greens, the herbs, mainly nowadays. Of course, there's a lot of new crops being studied, but the majority of vertical farms are nowadays leafy greens and herbs. Uh, so that is the, the, the value of that vertical farm end product market, but also the technology market where we are active at the time. So first few notes we've come up with quite recently, actually. Indoor vertical farming has a big role in sustainable agriculture, printed by Forbes um, in February. Does it really? Um, it probably uh, plays a part, but of course it's still quite difficult to see that, let's say, bulk commodity food products being grown in vertical farms. It's, it's awfully expensive to build that sort of infrastructure to actually grow and high nutritional value crops in vertical farms. And that's the main reason why we're starting with leafy greens because of the low calorie content, which makes it cost efficient to produce in vertical farms. Does it happen ever? I believe that we are moving towards that, but it is still difficult to see how long it will it take to actually produce high nutritional value crops in vertical farms. But having said that, there is significance in vertical farming development on the on the global scale, I believe. Vertical farms expand as demand for year-round produce grows. New York Times. There's not, not too much about that. Then the rise of vertical farms could could indoor plant factories be the norm in 10 years? Guardian printed notion. Um, I think that 10 years is probably too short period of time to actually see that all CEA would be indoor vertical farms. But I think that we will see rapid growth in this anyways. Cucumber capital growers selling up as Brexit and energy crisis hit Britain's vegetable industry. This is actually pretty new, only about a month old news that uh, because of Brexit and because of this gas prices and everything, uh, in Britain they are cutting down 60 hectares of cucumber production. And if year-round greenhouse hectares we have um, about 140 hectares in all of Finland year-round production and Britain is cutting 60 hectares down, that's huge amount of, of production. But if it, if it doesn't make financial sense, then, then it just doesn't make financial sense. And this is pretty interesting news came up a week ago. BlackRock um, and Nasdaq uh, announcement that BlackRock is saying that best sectors to invest during inflationary times, so these, let's say, very volatile times for any investments. And they are mentioning agricultural technology. So they really believe that, that we are going to need to put a lot of money into this development of technology and seeing the, the ways to actually produce certain crops in future. Well, then to few, let's say, arguments why vertical farming makes sense and one is this how to prevent global warming by reducing emissions so preventing global warming i think it's naive to say that we can prevent it it's already happened and it's very difficult to actually backtrack on that one um, but i think the more important thing and more important arguments right now is how to preserve food production capabilities in water scarce areas. So we see all these um, 
no change of draws. We take a look at that later on. But um, that is one big thing. And the second big thing is since we are already in, in the middle of climate change, how can we actually produce the crops with this changing environment? It is getting awfully difficult in certain and a lot of areas actually to grow in greenhouses, even because of the solar intensity and the temperatures are just way too high and the cost for cooling down that that greenhouse is getting very difficult. So I think what we need to collaboratively, even this Finnish, uh, let's say, community of vertical farmers and, and technology companies needs to focus on how we can actually produce food with this changing environment and, and approve or uh, accept the facts that we are already in the middle of this crisis. Well, if we go to market drivers, and this is what I, I said about the uh, how to produce crops in water scarce areas. And here you see two maps. One is Europe, one is US, and where we have exceptional droughts this year. Like Lake Mead was uh, Lake Mead, which is feeding the water for 80 million people, and the water level was dropping in the middle uh, midsummer, about one and a half two meters per week. So it was awful situation. A lot of people were really scared about what's going to happen, and this means that actually a lot of field areas are idled. So you cannot grow in those field areas because there's no water available to grow there. So this is definitely one of the biggest drivers, how to grow um, crops in these areas where you just cannot have the water that you need for growing. And if you're on open field, the worst case scenario, you, you may need to put even 250 liters per kilogram of potatoes production. In greenhouse, a state of the uh, state of the art finished greenhouse unit, 36 liters per kilogram. In vertical farms, you can go down to one and a half, two liters per kilogram. So it is very difficult even with greenhouses to operate on these areas that you just don't have the water available. And FAO, FAO uh, stated that, that um, the production of grains have dropped so significantly that it means that 111 million people around the world are eating less bread because of this lack of grains for, for baking. So we are actually facing pretty serious crisis right now, even though the water levels are a little bit recovering because we are going towards winter, but it's only temporary. And next year we are probably facing same or even worse situations. And from NASA reports, we see that in 2007, we are actually, these are the areas where we cannot produce corns, corn anymore in 2070. And corn is one of the biggest biggest uh, cereals or grains being produced. So if we go to market drivers, what are driving the, the vertical farming market? Global warming, of course, that, that's the, the clear answer. Shortage of, of fresh water, these are probably the two most significant ones. And I think this uh, energy discussion is, of course, important for Nordic areas and northern production areas. But then again, the water issue is much bigger globally than the energy issue. Uh, climbing energy prices, of course, this is more of a Nordic thing, but but also in Central Europe, the, the greenhouses are struggling with these energy prices right now. So it's affecting the northern areas, but also the southern areas where you need to use a lot of energy for cooling. And that is also problematic because of these energy prices. Shortage of fuels may be an issue, but that's more clearly seeing at the energy price rise right now. Uh, pest problems, climate change, we have milder winters. It's not so easy to disinfect greenhouses anymore because we can just let the frost come in and kill the, the pests. But now we just need to use more chemicals or some other means to disinfect the greenhouses, even here in North. Food safety issues, food mileage. Um, and greenhouses have significant problems in adapting to this climate change because you need to cool them down. And uh, we, when you have 1000 watts per square meter solar radiation, it's awfully difficult to cool down that amount of energy coming in. 
Well, if you if we take a look of the numbers, um, the overall well, food working in food market is is um, rewarding. Maybe that's not the right word, but anyways, it's the biggest commodity market in the world. Of course, everybody must eat, but there's a lot of things we don't have to do necessarily. But eating is is a must. Eight to 11, 11 trillion US dollars. It's a lot of money, but also a lot of food. The well, vegetable market is about about one percent uh, of of oh, sorry ten percent of the overall global food market. But it is actually growing one percent um, units faster than the overall food market, which is actually indicating that we are increasing our vegetable eating over other food food um, segments, which is of course good thing. And then if we take a look at overall indoor vertical, uh, sorry, indoor farming technology market, CEA market, it's about $14.5 billion and growing fast, about 9.4% 9, 9 annually. Well, if we go in the numbers of vertical farming itself, so CEA is all the greenhouse and all, let's say, a little bit higher technology growing. Uh, in vertical farming side, the growth growth rate is 25%. So if we compare the vertical farm market growth to CEA market growth, we are actually growing many times faster in vertical farming field. And what this indicates is that vertical farm is actually cannibalizing the, the CEA market or, or greenhouse market. It's not extending the market, but cannibalizing the existing ways of production. And as long as it's done, done smartly and we are actually achieving these climate goals and these water saving goals, it is a very good thing. But of course, vertical farming can mean a lot of things, but still I believe that the, the direction is right. Currently four and a half billion dollars expected to grow $33 billion by 2030. So there's a lot of room and this is extremely fast growing global market, 25%, meaning that there's a lot of room to do business here. And that's why I'm happy to see that we have a lot of people interested about this field. And I also believe that because we are the northernmost uh, agricultural country in the world, so we have something that other, um, uh, other areas or competing areas don't necessarily have the mindset of understanding the difficulties of, of farming. And this way, I believe that we have a lot to give to this market in Finland. And lastly, how we see that the, the overall vertical farming market is developing right now. So we are, I believe that we are actually moving from this emerging market, let's say, model to this more developing market model. Emerging market means that um, we have pioneers who have invested, well, some, some uh, areas a little smaller amounts of money and some areas a huge amounts of money in this pioneer endeavors of vertical farms. Um, if we look at these this big names uh, in the business in US, for example, Air Farms, um, Bovary in, uh, in Farms, German, um, Plenty. So they are farmers with self-made technology. And this is very typical when there is no technology companies available to, to give you tested verified technology then you have to build the technology yourself. And then they are serving the retailers. Uh, developing market, which I believe that we are heading towards or already there, means that there are technology suppliers like Netlet, and then there's farmers that are buying the technology and serving the retailers, the end clients. And, um, then when we are moving towards commodity market, assuming that we are, that the whole market is developing as the greenhouse market uh, originally developed, we are heading towards uh, an arrangement where there's technology suppliers, uh, farm owners, and separate operating companies and end clients. And separate open operators and farm owners means that the farm owners are funds or private equity or, or not necessarily banks, but private equity, most likely. And the operators are offering all that manual work and all those buying stuff and selling stuff from the farm 
and guaranteeing the farm owners have the, the return of investment. But then again, the operators are doing the heavy lifting and bearing the, the risks of, of the operation itself. And this is the model that, that the big greenhouse operations in, in North America, for example, are working, that the farm owners are not doing anything. They are just, just taking the, the cream out of the cake, and then the operators are doing the heavy lifting for those operations. But then beyond food, what, what can we grow in future? Uh, what market, where can this market actually expand? Because those numbers we looked at are only food related markets. Well, we had three seedlings. This is something that have been done in vertical farms already. It's quite interesting before the, because the forest, forestation operations are growing and, and uh, increasing rapidly. We have beauty industry extracts. Um, we, we see a pilot project already in this, this side, which is pretty interesting. Medical extracts, uh, also the, the legal ones. And um, flowers, this is already done vertical farm way. But I believe that the, one of the biggest thing is going to be animal powder, cattle feed. And why is that? Because it's $73 billion industry, which is five times four or five times larger industry than, than CEA altogether right now. And even though if we see that vegetable eating is growing and we all, all want to see that more and more people are eating vegetables instead of, of meat, but the fact is that there will always be people willing to pay for meat. It doesn't matter how expensive it is. And then there's also market going to be for the, for the animal fodder. And this is how vertical farming can actually influence the protein supply chain instead of just carbon hydrates and these, these um, vegetables. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nico. And our next speaker is Juuso Mätä, Technology Manager from Pinoa Foods. All right, uh, my name is Juuso Mätä. I'm the Technology Manager at Pinoa Foods. We are part of the category of farmers that have their self-made technology. It's so noted earlier, we are a producer and farmer farm here in Espo area. And I'm going to talk about microgreen vertical farming today. But first about Pinoa Foods. Netlet might be really familiar for you, but Pinoa Foods might be a little bit unknown. unknown. So we are vertical farm here in Espo area, originally in Helsinki in Vallila. Founded in 2018, we initially provided microgreens for, for restaurants, around 20 to 30 different varieties. But 2020, we had to make some adjustments for obvious reasons. And, and then we piloted to consumer, consumer business, which is currently, currently where our business is is mainly focused. We have few technology projects ourselves, but currently we are providing microgreens nationwide. Nationwide, perhaps you have seen our produce in K markets or Christmas. We provide all the way from Helsinki to Rovaniemi here in Finland. Our main products are pea microgreens, sunflower, radish, and mix of, mix of baby leaves. And now we are launching or also broccoli and broccoli and rucola microgreens. But yeah, here yeah, as know that we have developed our own technology for microgreen production because we like to, there's not most of the technology for vertical farming is focused on potted herbs. So there's not much. Uh, providers of that kind of growing technology for microgreens because there's some some details that are different and we have we have developed our own our own technology for that that the 
focus of our technology development has been on the cultivation environment and especially the irrigation irrigation system of that we're using the word precision irrigation technique technique for for our irrigation technique most vertical farm yes. technology use the ebb and flow ebb and flow irrigation but we use those kind of growing trays and offer only the exact amount of water that they need every few days instead of instead of flowing water <clears throat> and because we are mainly farmers with really really low r d budget our focus in our development has always been in being really really cost efficient are as seen in the picture that one of our earlier designs of our production shelves the super structure is really cost efficient from outside of vertical farm industry and that enables us to get some good cost savings the current current shelves that we we use are our first in first out shelves that offer us to have like production flow from from the seedling phase to the harvesting phase to our production we're currently yeah, we're currently operating at keran hallit really really close to otaniemi yeah but we have developed basically in our cultivation environment most of the stuff we have developed ourselves from scratch all from the electronics component of the control system to the software components also we have wireless user interface that we use to control it and the focus of our like control system is on precision we can like do really precise precise control of for example irrigation to only few trays can get different irrigation that they trace next to them next to them so we can have like in our current production we could have in few uh, few square meters even like 10 different varieties if if we would want growing with different recipes and we can control airflow also also with the same accuracy and yeah we currently we're not using but we have also uh, developed an interface with lightweight m2m protocol to have like interface for higher level control systems with iot capabilities but yeah why are we focusing our own development in microgreens there's two different details first is the fact that the potted herbs technology all already exists there's plenty of players there we if we want to use that we can buy it as like for example from netlet but for microgreens there's not much available but the other thing is that we we believe microgreens to fit even better for vertical farming and microgreen product like usage of microgreens markets has been steadily growing and we believe that it is currently in a phase where potted herbs were in the 80s or 90s so like still as really small market but it's it's soon going to start growing rapidly and as we can see nowadays spotted herbs are, are like really basic thing that everyone buys from store and we well, uh, believe that microgreens can be at the same stage in 10 or 20 years and these are few of the reasons that they have higher vitamin and mineral content on compared to the basic potted herbs but especially in vertical farming and especially in current times when there the energy crisis is getting and winter is coming closer these numbers are from our own production because we are doing both of them the growing cycle for microgreens is much shorter because the microgreens the face of the plant that grows with the nutrition and the energy of the seed so it basically basically the really initial phase of the plant but it has 
really high nutrition density in my, my vitamin and minerals. And because it's really short cycles, it takes over 10 times less LED hours. And that, that results in big savings in, in uh, energy consumption. And all, also, because it doesn't have to be in pot, the yield can be much higher per square meter because we can use that kind of trays that have the plants like basically, you know, one big mat of sea of microgreens growing next to each other. And yeah, this is the reason we believe that microgreens are going to uh, take, some, take some market from the other herbs when people like find out that like it's a little bit healthier it uh, we are and i think like when if energy prices continue to rise up it will uh, be in the like price of the end produce we will see all the also the differences of the of the growing cycle growing cycle but yeah there's some like different aspects like of vertical farming microgreens compared to the potted herbs as i know that the shorter growing cycle is, is the like key issue type key difference and it also affects really much like the whole production like it, it like the importance of automation in the whole production cycle of like sowing and harvesting and packing all that becomes much much more important important because if the plants are only for a few days under the light it means that there's like the production is shooting out produce like every other day so there has to be a lot of employees or really good machinery to handle that that quick quick flow of produce through the production but also it offers really good possibilities because we have so many harvests during the during the year so if we have some for example some ai application we can get a good amount of data really quick feedback and do some optimization with this data like really quick iteration especially compared to like traditional farming where you can get one one like feedback once a year or perhaps twice a year but now we can get like once a week from all the different growing growing trays but yeah speaking of growing, growing the trays that also makes some differences for the for the production technology i i stated about the different irrigation system we be, there could be some ways to do some ebb and flow irrigation system using the trays but we have uh, in our production we have found that being not not so feasible it's so we have built completely different different irrigation systems that applies water from the side and up to straight to the tray and have like few liters per tray every every other day and that that makes it, it makes we have to may be able to control like big range of um magnetic valves to be able to control precisely different growing growing cells that we have to control separately and instead of having ebb and flow system where you basically might have only a pump and water the whole system at once but instead of pots what it come when it comes to logistics and automation of logistics in production it using trays is offers a good possibility because we can use basically a traditional warehouse automation because the growing trays are quite similar to like boxes that how can can we we can like move them with just basic conveyors or use re really similar to traditional automation in warehouses for lifting systems on stuff like that and of course with lower crops 
we can may have lower levels with and we can have more levels in our vertical farming system compared to having some little bit higher crops like basil and then there are some minor minor differences also regarding like the need of airflow we have to have not only air conditioning but we have to have the flow of air to make the plants grow grow strong and increase weight and stuff like that but yeah that was my presentation looking forward to hear your questions in the panel thanks yeah thank you Jordan. so our next presenter is harry from yield systems and i believe your title is business development right uh co-founder and yeah mo mostly on the business side <laughs> <laughs> yes. great to be here thank you for the invitation so my name is uh, Harri Juntunen, one of the co-founders of Yield Systems. <clears throat> we are a spin-out company of uh, Aalto University Research to Business Projects. Uh, 2017, my co-founder Jussi Kilberg in the Computer Science Department uh, had a Business Finland funding for doing this Tutli or Research to Business project. Um, and, and he has been studying quite a lot of uh, using of AI and machine learning technologies uh in in plants or in generally in in agriculture and and this is what we are doing at the moment we we were founded 2018 and then we had a minor covid hit but <laughs> here we still are uh so we are using machine vision and other technologies in in food so this is our motivating problem quite nicely uh nico uh laid out the, the whole thing so that we will uh only for the compensating the uh, population growth in 2050 that's only uh, how many 30 seasons away so quite quite close there so we will need to increase food production 60 percent and then we need to compensate also the climate change uh, extreme weather and such things drought too much water too cold and so forth so it's it's a bit of a tall order actually globally how do we how do we do this and definitely vertical farming is is one uh, technology to use. So we are using AI, and, and what is the uh, limiting factor of, of AI is, is uh, typically the data availability and accuracy, quantity, quality of, of data. So, so this was the key insight from our business to research that we, 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 we will need to innovate ways to actually produce data more efficiently than is currently avail available. So what we are doing, we are <clears throat> quite simply answering very, very straightforward questions that, that what are the plants like in the growth environment, on the field, in the vertical farm, uh, wherever that, that happens. And, and this, this, what the plants are like is called phenotype of the plant. So that here you can see the tree over there, there's a phenotype of, of that tree. And, and the phenotype is always a result from the genetics and the environment and the management, how the plant is, is then handled. So uh, here you can see the picture. Typically, I have a video, but I was not sure for the broadcasting reasons whether they run or not. But you can see in the pictures there are blue uh, marks on on the slide, and and they are uh, uh, machine vision has identified them as as spikes. So we basically count spikes, leaves, stems, but every any kind of a trait of the plant with with machine vision. And spikes and, and, and grains, especially, tend to correlate quite well with, for example, with yield. So that when we can count how many spikes, how many grain, how many seeds there is, then we can ever estimate that this is the yield from this field. So quite simple, but simple question, but difficult to execute, actually. So we have been developing a scalable, cost efficient machine vision and analytics. So we are using, for example, mobile phone to actually collect the data. One of the curiosities of the, of the agriculture is that that nowhere globally there is money in in this field, even though that our our livelihood depends on the production of of different things. Uh, there's there's typically very very thin margins and and no money. So we are using we've we've solved the problem so that we are using mobile phones, which which is a global platform for data collection, and and try to algorithmically then do the rest of the things. We are using also satellite information, basically uh, perhaps drones. What happened now? 
or any other kind of a data, but but really that what are the plants like on the field is, is a key bottleneck because uh, that information is, is now missing and, and that needs to happen every year. So will there be food this year is, is also a good question. Uh, it turns out that this phenotypic what are the plants like question has, has several applications and I will now focus on, on two of them, plant breeding and combining that with vertical farming. So, the plant breeding has mostly been focused on breeding plants for out, outdoor growth environments because the scales are so massive and in the future uh, most of our food will still come from, from outdoors so, so that uh, the breeding has been focused on, on there. But there is a, 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 good, a good opportunity to actually breed plants for specifically for vertical farming, for example. That might be an, a good opportunity. Uh, uh, the other thing in, in plant breeding has been that, um, that the plants have been breeded in the relative stable outdoor, outdoor growth conditions. And, and this is not what we are seeing at the moment uh, in Europe or in, in Argentina or, or unfortunate poor in Ukraine can also in, impact on, on these, these kind of things. And <clears throat> we, have, we have been focusing on very few plants. So it's, it's staggering that 60% of all calories and proteins that we obtain, they really come from three different plants, rice, maize and wheat. So, so uh, when we have the climate risks, extreme weather conditions, and then we have very narrow genetical base for the calories that we are, uh, are producing, then I think that we, we have a quite a big risk globally here. So imagine now that there's war and then if there would be some kind of a wheat disease globally and we would be losing uh, let's say 80% of wheat production in a year and that would be a disaster. So, so it's very fragile and risky system at, at the moment what we are. I don't know why it's so but it, it is so. <laughs> so the question is that how, how can we speed up breeding of new totally new plants in, on a commercial scale, industrial scale and more diverse uh, varieties, climate resilient varieties. And one of the things what we can do tackling in, in this problem is the combining now the vertical, uh, the guy in the picture seems pretty familiar. <laughs> so uh, so uh, combining physical growth environments, vertical farms, and then what we are using uh, simulations in, in the mm -hmm. virtual world. So using synthetic data, game engines, simulating different kinds of, of growth environments, be it drought or rain or even lightning conditions, what we have been discussing with, with Arttu, so that simulating all, all that will give us such a data that, that we can actually observe the plants, what, what do they look like. Otherwise, obtaining this kind of a training data would be, would be uh, impossible. Uh, the plants are so varied, uh, the conditions are so varied, lightning conditions are so varied, that we, we simply don't have time and money to collect the training data from the real world. And uh, luckily we have now the simulation capabilities and they are developing quite fast. For example, Tesla is, is using our methods, <laughs> let's say so. <laughs> okay, joke aside. But uh, what, what, what could be, what, what we have been trying to do uh, and, and, and willing to do here in, in this trade of, of vertical farming and plant breeding, that the current paradigm, it's not that black and white, but the current product, paradigm is that, that we, we make a, 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 a tests. We make tests outdoors and then we wait and test and test. And this takes years, like five to 10 years to, to develop a new variety. Uh, Instead, we could be doing simulations in different kind of uh, vertical farms or controlled environments uh, using uh, AI to observe how, how the simulations are going and then test in the real world and observing them again that how do they perform against the simulations and so forth and, and really drastically reduce uh, the time to, time, to, time to market or time to field so that we would have uh, more, more plants, um, climate resilient plants. And this is something that we have been collaborating now with, with Luke, uh, Titta and, and Arttu and other Helsinki University people. Also Metropolia is, I, I see here, presented so, so that uh, 
Uh, we are developing these kind of the smart experiments and, and different kind of the things that how do we can maximally utilize AI in, in this kind of uh, plant, uh, uh, plant breeding and other plant related topics. So uh, we said there are a lot of opportunities because if you want to design a, let's say, a vertical farm around AI, it would be a bit different looking than it's currently possible. So, so these are the things that we are doing and, and researching in, in the vertical farm side. Uh, and yeah, to close, uh, uh, we, are, as, uh, we are one com company participating in this kind of uh, uh, multidisciplinary cooperation environment. We are waiting for the funding decision. DIPTA is, I believe, heading the initiative uh, and, and uh, uh, to build a, a, a totally new kind of vertical farm here in Otaniemi. Uh, with, with modu module, mo different kinds of modules for simulations and for testing out lightning or, or irrigation or whatever there is needed. And, and yeah, uh, hopefully we can get this, this project forward and, and then we can start uh, really developing simulations and AI for the better planet. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, so now, now we thank need to you. Switch. Yeah, thank you very much, Harry. Uh, our next speaker comes uh, online from Rovaniemi. He's Henri Jaatinen, crop specialist at Novarbo. Let me see. Yeah. So hold on just a sec that we'll get uh, Henry online. Can you hear me? Connected and showing presentation. Recording in progress. So, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, nice. So, thanks for the introduction. All right, so greetings from Rovaniemi and thank you for the whole working group for inviting me here. Being the last one, there must be some repetition or overlap with the, with the previous speakers, but I try to skip those and I, I hope that I can bring some valuable information to the table. I'm Henry Adren and I work as a cultivation specialist at Novarba. And today I want to speak to you about the, the food production side of the or I, of our industry. Okay, so Novarba, Novarba was founded in 2007. We've been providing substrates and organic fertilizers for, for professionals. Uh, one new interesting thing is uh, wood-based substrates. We have new biofiber facility up and running and we will be manufacturing peat-free substrates next year. We also provide uh, CEA technology. One thing is our heat reuse system that enables a closed environment for greenhouses and vertical farms. Our uh, vertical farms go from uh, fully automated turnkey solutions to container farms that are mainly for research and education purposes. Our R&D facility was built in 2018 and now for four years we've been doing our R&D work there. We have a portfolio for over 20 most popular leafy greens and uh, we aim uh, to match the customers needs in our solutions with regards to the size and level of automation. We can refine the business models to make our clients flourish and uh, we have a high expertise in the industrial symbiosis. So this is a bit controversial question, but can vertical farming really feed the world? Is it food or just a side dish? Mainly um, leafy greens are applicable at the moment. Berries, as far as I know, are not yet economically viable. 
and so-called basic lettuce like uh, loose leaf lettuce, crisp head lettuce and others are, are produced in large quantities. But like your Matta said, I think that there's, uh, we, should, we should prefer more nutritious plants. There are fast growing cabbages, for example, like kale that contain uh, a lot of uh, more vitamins, minerals and fiber that could be more, more uh, better for human health. Uh, here's some challenges about vertical farming. One thing is that um, we are often competing with greenhouses as for Finland and producing like same crops with similar price and uh, the justification for the premium price might be a bit hard sometimes because for example in Japan people really want to pay more for ultra clean lettuce but maybe it's not the same same thing here in Finland. So how do we differentiate from greenhouses with really authenticated sustainability? That needs some LCA and other things like that the Natural Resources Institute of Finland is doing and VTT. And for example, Association for Vertical Farming is uh, doing work right now to create this kind of sustainability certification for, for vertical farms that could really, really be useful for this industry. Also, consumer communication is critical because not everyone knows what, what this is all about and is it really sustainable and, and so on. Also, utilization of different kinds of industrial symbiosis to reduce the operational expenses and to really improve the sustainability can be a bit challenging sometimes. More challenges. Uh, Finnish modern greenhouses are super efficient. Um, the greenhouse producers are famous for their high yield, for example, with cucumber. Also, the support policy kind of maintains these old structures and um, there might be some heavy restrictions to introduce new crops when it comes to the financial support side. Also, we are building a truly sustainable vertical farm. Is um, it, it really demands a multidisciplinary company? There's a lot of engineering with the with the building, the structures, automation, and also the HVAC systems. Uh, when it comes to cultivation, you should never never kind of forget the plant when you are designing the the farm. Here's a list of the main advantages. I think most of you are very familiar with this, but the most um, uh, most significant ones are the high productivity year-round, resource use efficiency, and we are protected from the extreme weather that is super important, especially in the in the future. So we are going towards mainstreaming, but there's a lot of technical development to be done. And, um, and Hannu told about AI, but uh, it still needs development to when we only gather, gather all the data. The AI can really help us to combine all of the different growth factors and really, really to improve the, the production as a whole. Also, new spectrums are important. A lot of LED lighting research is done, and it's not always the LED fixture efficiency, that is the thing that brings you the best yield. It's also, also uh, if you want kilos per square meter or best quality, you need to be really careful with the, with the spectrum. Also, strategies to reduce the capital expenses can be done by smart design of the farm, where you put it, how you build it, and operational expenses as well. Can you really make, make good use out of the side streams? And can you, for example, sell the sur surplus energy to the district heating system, for example? What DIT and others are doing, we need new protein and energy rich crops to CEA in greenhouses and vertical farms. A lot of breeding to be done. And also genetic modification should be made available everywhere to get this whole CEA industry forward and agriculture as a whole. Vegetable and forest seedlings are a big thing that uh, improve the overall, overall 
productivity of our food systems. Medicinal plants like cannabis and biofarming, where you make the plants to produce you the novel compounds and molecules, is one big thing. Also, it might make sense to increase the diversification or resilience and self-sufficiency of our food systems. And one thing you can do is uh, upgrade the capacity of our modern greenhouses by combining them with the vertical farms, with the seedling production. Possible solutions to accelerate the CEA from food without fields done by VTT and uh, Natural Resources Institute of Finland says that one thing is supporting the sustainable production even more. Education and know-how is one big thing. There's a picture on the right from our cultivation container that we built to Gradia Yamsa earlier this year, and they are training the future horticulturists there. Investment subsidies is one really big thing that could make this industry move to the next level in Finland. Maybe the long-term regime change in the whole production structure could, could uh, use some, some optimization, like the new crops, protein crops, energy-rich crops that Dita, is, Dita and others are doing. Maybe there's some, some uh, also some, some optimization with the different PPFD demands between the crops. Some crops need more light, some needs very little. So maybe it's a good thing to put the right, right crops to the, the right production systems. But yeah, I think vertical farming can really support feeding the world. There's this industrial symbiosis that increase the circular economy. Uh, for example, our hydro system uses the excess heat, maybe to the neighboring building or straight to the district heating network. Um, one thing that Artu told us about is the electricity and vertical farming is a really good solution for the demand side management, where we can use the electricity on the hours and the demand is really low. Also streamlining of the whole food production. Uh, I think that vertical farms can play a, a significant role in there. Our fruitful fields are um, declining. Some, some crops need to go to the greenhouses and there's optimization like what plants to be in greenhouse, what plants go to the vertical farms. Also, disease-free seedlings are a big thing. They can be produced in vertical farms and move to greenhouses, seasonal high tunnels, open field and also reforestation projects that are super important. So yeah, I think vertical farming can support feeding the world because we can also, also make food when, where it's impossible in the traditional ways. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Sorry, then pitäkin liikkua tähän ilmeisesti tähän kaariin. On parempi feng shui. Tämä on Mä pari tuulia tälle suolella. I hope you can hear us in the online. Do you think possible we are close enough to
so yeah thank you everyone for the presentation it was really interesting stuff and you could really see the multidisciplinarity in this this field of vertical farming that there are so many different ideas from from different sectors and i think that's one of the main things why this whole industry is so so interesting and now for the for the next stage our idea is to ask these panelists a couple of questions so it's going to be very relaxed you can put your speculation hat on so you don't need to base everything on numbers because we're going to ask you about making projections for the next 20 20 to 30 years so obviously there is a lot of lot of room for speculation and maybe we would like to start with the question of the electricity price because it is something that everybody is talking right now due to the war in ukraine and also some supply policy related problems we have seen a very steep rise in the, the price of electricity and also heat and as uh, nico said in the uk a, a big amount of greenhouse growers are not going to grow during the next winter because it's just too expensive and in the finnish media it has been told that maybe up to 50 percent of the finnish greenhouse growers might also need to skip the next winter season so of course this means that there will be a big shortage of uh, local food in the coming winter and maybe now for the panelists my my question is that it's of course very bad for the the whole greenhouse industry the rising electricity prices but also of course vertical farms are also using electricity to provide the led lamps so maybe i could start by asking nico how do you see this Ele rising electricity prices in Europe in relation to vertical farming in, in short run and also in, in long run? Yeah, that's a good question. I want to correct first that 60 hectares is actually uh, greenhouses demolished. So the, they, are not okay. yeah, they are not going to continue growing ever again. Okay. <laughs> because they get better price for selling real estate instead of that area, real estate instead of waiting for another year and maybe somebody's paying enough money for the queues. But anyways, going back to the electricity price thinking, so a lot of uh, energy specialists are saying that in long term energy is definitely going to get cheaper and cheaper. Eventually, it's going to be ridiculously cheap. Uh, what we are seeing right now is temporary disruptions of energy infrastructure, meaning that markets are taking their time to adjust into these changes. And what could, one good example is the raw material prices, what we are monitoring closely because we are using a lot of aluminium and this sort of stuff in our vertical farms. Uh, in April, we did a quotations for clients. And we checked that aluminium price was three and a half thousand euros per ton. And one month later, when we are revising those quotations, it was two and a half thousand euros per ton. So it means that in originally the 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 um, the Kaupasarto of of the um, Russia meant that that aluminium didn't flow to European market and global markets, and it took one month to actually find another route back to the global markets, and then the, it fixed the prices. So what we are going to see in electricity is, is more or less something like that: that new ways of of let's say rearranging the markets is taking place yeah. and, and the futures are saying that next summer we are back to four cents per kilowatt hour yeah and do you also feel that there could be some kind of a creative destruction now that if the greenhouse growers are going bankrupt now during this winter there will be a lot less supply on the, the local food side so do you see this as an opportunity for the vertical farm market well i think that the greenhouses are they are fast to adapt to this situation because they can just shut down the operation and there's very little costs when you shut down greenhouse and wait for the next year but but the i think the biggest question is whether the retail and the, the consumer market can actually wait for that long and this is probably driving the retailers to to look for and even incentivize ways to produce where they can actually guarantee long term the supply of those products and this could actually be the biggest let's say, uh, impact on vertical farming and expanding the vertical farming uh, business. Yeah, and if anybody else wants to comment from the panel, you can just jump in whenever you want. Maybe you also because you are selling to the, the consumers. Do you feel like if we get a little bit of shortage in the, the food 
supply during this next winter? Do you think the prices will hike in the, the vegetable section? Do you think there is room to go even higher than it already is in Finland? Yeah, I think, I think to be honest, the energy crisis gives us a, in at Pinoa a good opportunity because like we are working mainly on a category that is a little bit unfamiliar for people and if there's less supply to other categories it definitely will uh, give an opportunity to us because perhaps consumers are then looking for different alternatives yeah i, I would like a follow-up question that what are your thoughts on for example, from the uh, consumer side, there has been on the media that these Optivatti and companies like that, that have been developing like for 10 years or so, developing these systems that you, to automate the consumption according to the peak hours and away from those peak hours. And I was just reading about that, that it's something that been, has been slow to start because the electricity has been so cheap. But what you see in sort of like in the context of vertical farming, growing plants, you know, this type of systems uh, to uh, control the electricity prices, you know, it's just from the technological side of view. Do you use them? Do you offer them? And Nico uh, and how how do you see this? Yeah, we, actually, we are still farming in such a small volume that for us, the infrastructure is the biggest expense so we have actually kind of scheduled our consumption of electricity so it's basically all the time the same because the plants want kind of continuous day cycle it cannot be like one hour off one hour on the lights and it has to be some like like depending on the variety of the crop it's like 10 hours to 14 or even to 18 or something like that but, but it's one continuous and we have schedules and them so that the capacity of our electricity like wires are all time used properly so <laughs> we are, don't have actually so much fluctuation in our production yeah and Arthur, i i remember you telling about your adventures of finding the dimming system for your experiments if you can share a bit about that, how did it go? You know, because one would imagine that, like we've been discussing, that we've been to the moon decades ago, <laughs> that something like this would be like super simple and you could have 50 different providers and you can choose from, but you didn't have such a straightforward experience. Yeah, it was a <clears throat> surprisingly long, uh, long hours of Googling I had to spend to find actually a product which is capable of kind of like, introducing like these kind of like automated uh, lighting regime programs. You can have like simple ramp up and ramp down timers, but that's basically it. But there's only a few, like a handful of companies which actually have those kind of products, which you can actually program different changes throughout the photo period into your lighting regime. But yeah, eventually I did fi find yeah. one, one product and like, I'm happy that I'm, I can actually use it in my PhD project. So, <laughs> so how about Nico? Your insights from your perspective? We actually did a uh, pilot project with Fortum maybe two, three years back, where we connected our own R and D form into this active in in grid trading. Mainly, it wasn't because of the high prices or low prices, but this fast, fast uh, frequency compensation. Uh, trading and this uh, because the greenhouses they can only react in 15 minutes you cannot just shut them down and instantly just turn them back on you will burn the, the lamps but with leds you can actually go every second down and up and down and up and and, and it, it doesn't mean that we have to go all the way down it's just we can we go with 10 percent down we go 15 percent down and then we recover from there and we did that and uh and during the pillar project we were it was actually uh, actively controlled by the actual trading, automatic trading of those those um, instruments. But because the electricity price is so low and uh, and these other reasons, infrastructure price and all of these things, there's a lot of other things that needs to be prioritized before these can be implemented and actually get some some uh, meaningful, let's say, upside of those. But uh, now when the price is up, there is definitely significant amount of savings that can be done both on on 
gliding during the cheap hours, but also uh, compensating these frequency changes on the grid. So basically, the grid phase you to kind of lower your intensity when there is a high demand on the. Uh, so it means that if the frequency goes down 0.1 hertz, then there is this um, emergency, uh, let's say, practices taken in place. And if you give your electricity load into that reserve, that it can actually be turned down automatically with certain, let's say, proof <laughs> rates, then uh, the FinGrid is actually paying you money to be in that reserve. And it doesn't matter if they use your load or not, but they are still paying you to be in that reserve. And um, the good thing about LEDs is that you can actually go into that really fast phase. And the, the, the back when we did that research the, or testing, the, the price they paid was about 23 cents, uh, sorry, two, two and a half cents or so per, per kilowatt hour, meaning that we are actually getting half back from the electricity price wow. that we are buying. Great, thank you. Uh, we can continue if ideas come follow later, but uh, considering the time and we have a list of very nice questions and we also might have there in the chat, but uh, I would like to continue about this uh, species and variety discussion that is uh, like it's uh, nowadays it's lettuce and herbs and you know, we've heard that microgreens. So what's the next step? Nico touched upon that, you know, that there's a lot of pharmaceutical plants and uh, strawberries and whatnot, but you mentioned the big thing is animal feed. I, I remember, was it a year ago already or something, I saw the news from Ohio that they were actually indeed in vertical farm growing basic grass to cows, wasn't it? So you really, because I, I thought that your point was quite surprising that that's going to be the big thing. I say that that's going to be one of the big things, definitely. So, but but Timo Oksan, I don't know if you know Timo Oksan from uh, from Kangasala. So he actually grew uh, fodder in the 70s with mercury lamps already in his his um, uh, cow house. So um, it's not new thing, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but it's going to be big because uh, those huge areas uh, in Ohio, I think that's the biggest place where they have big issues with lack of water, then the most of that water is used to grow that fodder. So if they have 350,000 heads in that one ranch and they cannot have that fodder grown locally because the, 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 the groundwater is dropping fast, so then they don't have any options but take down the, the amount of heads and uh, then there's not going to be a supply of those. And the problem is that to actually recover from one year cut down of production of, of that, that cattle, it takes several years to actually recover back to the old, old level. So it's going to be a long-term uh, impact on the, on the supply chains. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this I think is, is quite important point in that sense that in, in agriculture and plants in general, it, it's not like switching on and off, but once you reach the point that uh, some area, particular area, somewhat even partly collapses or, or has a significant disturbance. It's it's not that like ramping up next year would be normal, but it can take really five five years. I don't know, maybe there's another drought and then you have dusty soil and everything. And, and once those systems then start to collapse, they are not coming back because there's no water and anything like that. So so, so it's it's irreversible in, in, mm. in that sense. We, we've seen, seen now that uh, there are local disturbances and, and not yet irreversible irre changes. But for example, in Australia, um, there was um, a cattle died in, in, in millions, I believe it was, due to the coldness. It was ra raining so heavily and windy, then the cows and, and they practically froze on the fields. So these kind of extreme <laughs> weather conditions, they are not coming back and, and socially and economically and, and psychologically for, for the farmers and, and the producers, it's, it's really damaging. They are not going to cover from that. They go bankrupt and who's going to take over that business and so forth. So, so this is the, I think that the really, really important point to, to understand that these are not kind of a, you go to supermarket and let me buy a production site. It's, it's not like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I, I think it's it's interesting, uh, and of course it, it's 
related to all agricultural production and vertical farming about the species and varieties. It's also like depending on the, on the uh, geographical location, what is interesting, what is possible, and all the, for example, yeah, this cow feed example that from Finland's perspective, that seems just very far-fetched idea, but uh, like we just heard, it might very well make sense somewhere else. And like we heard that uh, in Japan, uh, they really prefer like clean products and, you know, all that sort of perspectives and consumer uh, preferences are different also. But what about going a bit back from the animal, animal feed side, uh, pharmaceutical uh, plants. I've uh, once learned that the medicinal plants, I've once learned that there are about 18,000 different plant species used for uh, producing different types of medicines. And two thirds of those plants are collected from the wild. They are not even grown in the fields, but they are just, you know, collected. So one can imagine all the hurdles with the climate change and so to secure that supply uh, do you think uh, yeah, there must be an opportunity and would be like high value crops so to say also to produce in is there anything going on in finland in europe we have something not in <laughs> finland but it's illegal here but but <laughs> <laughs> but but in, in in the more civilized world, uh, uh, for me, me, medical marijuana is, is is really a big business, truly. And and other medicinal plants, definitely there's room for that. Breeding them in in suitable for plant uh, vertical farms, uh, definitely a big uh, uh, opportunity, I would say. Uh, like you said, that they are simply collected out of the nature, and but but you could then breed different plants to to specific uh, having specific traits, like maximizing the the really the medical part of it and minimizing other things and so forth. And and there comes into play all all the lightning conditions and everything like that, so that you get the recipes right. Yeah. But definitely an opportunity. And how about Netflix as a technology provider? Have you had requests? We actually have a client who is producing extracts for medical uh, industry, not that crop, <laughs> <laughs> a different crop. And, and this is what I, I want to emphasize that there are, like you said, there are thousands of plants that are used in not necessarily the hardcore medical, but more of this uh, natural medicine field, like Chinese medicine, all these fields. And the consumption is, is huge and the demand is huge. And what we see is that the extracts that we can actually produce in vertical farms, the quality is at least three to four times better than what you can actually collect from nature or what you can grow in greenhouses. So this is probably one of the biggest things that we need to understand also here is that there are so much more things we can do with vertical farming than just lettuce or herbs or even food. And the, the value of these, um, for example, my sister has a horse and they are selling uh, herb assortments for horses for medical purposes for curing some certain, I don't know, I, I don't know anything about horses. But anyways, she said that they are selling these few grams of herbs, perfectly normal herbs, and it costs like 30 euros a bag. <laughs> so so there's huge amount of business opportunity all around this field if you just open our eyes a little bit beyond this, this, this narrow, currently big vertical farming field of, of lettuce and herb production. Yeah. One quite interesting uh, example, I think, from last year was from Middle East. I think it was in, from Iran, where they have grown uh, saffron plants and vertical mm -hmm. farming systems. And as you may know, saffron and uh, the spice used in food and uh, also, I think, in medicine in some, some parts is like uh, extremely expensive and uh, is to produce and also to collect and harvest. So that is a... Uh, Kind of like alternative uh, approach of like producing different different plants in vertical farming systems. Sure. And also a lot of these plants are endangered by the climate change. So mm -hmm. it might be the, the only option to grow them in vertical farms yeah. in the coming years. Yeah, and, uh, okay, yeah uh, and I think that there's also this kind of a mindset shift needs to happen so that in these cases the artificial is much better <laughs> than, than the organic or natural or whatever you want to call that. <laughs> and, and perhaps the artificial is also 
many times more environmentally friendly and, and everything than the traditional ways of doing something like saffron or anything like that. So also mind shift is for some reason people tend to think that organic or natural is is somewhat better or or more authentic or whatever kind of things where, where the numbers are saying that no the artificial way is, is much better okay. just today i noticed uh, an article on linkedin stating that uh, the u.s uh, department of agriculture has uh, stated that vertical farming produce can be labeled as organic produce okay great. so yeah not in europe not in europe <laughs> no so all the u.s well, they say pizzas are vegetables, so. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, you, do you have any like wild dreams of uh, coming up with new plant species for your, your technology? Yeah, I, I think for us, definitely like widening our like perspective, what what is the possibilities is something that we perhaps need to step up in, but we are because, of course, because we are like uh, have have already customers, so, so we have to like keep producing the stuff, but like expand some some other and start testing with. I think for for us it 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 has been mainly some jokes about growing some wine or <laughs> like there was uh, yeah 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 it has been mainly just company inside jokes and different varieties. But perhaps we should start taking those them. More seriously, and I think that Koti Pizza promised that if somebody will grow pineapple in Finland, they will buy it for their pizza production. So <laughs> okay. yeah, everything promise. local, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pineapple it is. Yeah, maybe we, yeah. we move on a little bit about the the future of the the markets and the the economy. So uh, Nico already touched this a little bit by saying that maybe in the next ten years vertical farming will not take over and it will be more maybe of a niche niche market still producing this kind of a couple specified plants that are really efficient to produce in a, in a vertical farm. But how do you feel in a little bit of long longer run, like say 20, 30 years, by 2015, do you think we can still cut down the investment cost by quite a lot by maybe applying economies of scale or by new kind of innovations? Like let's say if nowadays some automated system is 1000 euros per square cultivation square meter, do you think there's a lot of room in the future to kind of reduce the kind of investment cost? Honestly, I don't think the investment cost is a um, big player in the whole whole picture. So the OPEX, OPEX is the most significant one there. So it makes sense to pay a little bit more of the, of the equipment if the OPEX is actually better. And um, if the OPEX is a little bit better, then you're making more money every year than if you just pay a little bit less about the for technology and then you pay more every year because of that lower level of technology. So, so but but coming back to that economy, economy of scale, so it's very difficult right now to say what is future going to look like because, well, nobody expected this war and everything have taken place here. So, so, um, but if we think that, let's put it this way, if, if food price is climbing, and first of all, if we are saying that food price is now, I don't know, 10% higher than what it was a year ago, um, equivalent food basket. And what we are seeing right now is that the food prices, that food price rise that we see right now is actually because of the problems in supply chains last year. And now we see huge issues in supply chain this year, but this is going to affect food prices on next year. And this is going to be a horrible situation if, we, if now we are in 10% and we have barely, of course, we have issues last year, but nothing compared to this year. So it's going to be really horrific how much food is going to cost next year. So coming back to this, what makes sense to grow in vertical farms, saying, um, the market is going to be huge in these uh, low nutritional value crops. And I think there's going to be lettuce and herbs, there's going to be cukes, tomatoes, there's going to be maybe a little bit, there are interesting ways to grow potatoes and these a little bit higher, well, potatoes actually quite high on nutritional value, but a little bit higher nutritional value crops. So uh, it is really hard to, uh, to, to forecast what's going to happen. But if we, 
hypothesize that electricity price is going to be extremely cheap in future. And we hypothesize that food price is going to be really high in future. So if food price is really is, is high enough and the electricity price is low enough, anything makes sense to grow in vertical line. Yeah, that's that's even the pineapples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So now maybe a little bit even more speculation than than so far. If we think about that 2050 scenarios like what kind of like new innovations in the field of vertical farming? Something that really doesn't exist yet. H have you heard like of any extremely interesting new new stuff like maybe utilizing lasers instead of LED lights? Or do, do you have high hopes for any kind of a really like game breaking new innovations? How do you think AI can do it? Yeah, yeah, par partially AI can be part of, of many things, for example, robotics. Uh, now it was, uh, I, I didn't, if, if, if you watch, but there was the Tesla AI day and they announced a humanoid robot so that, that I promised that will cost like below $20,000 and it can operate then the same things that humans would be doing. That these kind of uh, robots could be interesting in, in the vertical farms that they would be operating that the thing. It's, it's surprisingly difficult to actually pick a berry or, or something like that. But definitely robotics, all, all kinds of automation, optimization, uh, when the facility is built around the idea that it will be automated and optimized uh, with, with an AI capabilities, uh, I, I think that it will change somewhat the, the existing things, materials, innovations, uh, and that kind of things. Uh, yeah, and how about the OPEX side, Nico? You talked it, it being extremely important. Do you see that there could be some kind of a leap in, in technology in that sense, like maybe not going beyond LED lights or, or some other kind of application? Well, usually the improvements in technology are gradual. And the challenge is that if we now introduce new way of doing something like, like lasers or something, it will take five years at least before we can implement those in, in, in the actual commercial farms. It's not that the technology doesn't work. We can actually prove pretty easily that it works, but the question is whether it works 10, 15 years that it should work and the life cycle expenses are reasonable. So that we honestly don't know if we now introduce something and put million euros into it and invest in the vertical farm with that technology. And, and then we find out after five years that it's it wasn't worth it. So that's why Small scale, it makes sense, but bigger scale, it usually goes back to a little bit more conservative development in, in technology. Yeah, definitely in, in all AgTech, it's the, the scaling part is, is the difficult one. Really taking time quite, quite a lot and, and proving that it, it really works on a global scale or even in a, in a vertical farm scale. So, so that is, and the plants are part of the equation as well. So that uh, <laughs> we, we need to understand that they are also complex organisms uh, that behave and react in, in specific ways. And it's it's not so that we just take something and put it in the under the light and wonders happen. But <laughs> it's it's really a complex operation to, to actually do it. So 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 also I think that the, what what can we have on the biology side of, of the plants genetics and that kind of things also come out and, and, and nicely play out in the context, context of vertical farming. Yeah, and I think Arthur has an insight for this. Yeah, touching about the plant part of the equation, uh, which also Titta mentioned earlier about like um, gaining insight from the plant's perspective, like what is their uh, like natural rhythm of daily, daily life, for example, and talking circadian rhythms how can we observe the natural rhythms of the plants and match external uh, conditions to meet those demands? For example, light and temperature rhythms. Um, plants, as uh, similarly to humans, have like natural rhythms where we tend to wake up at the same time and go to sleep every, at the same time every, every day. And if we find ways to uh, monitor those rhythms, we can actually match different uh, adjustments to the systems uh, much better than we do at the, at the current level. 
if we manage to find those technical solutions for that. And also machine learning and uh, image recognition and machine vision is going to most probably play a key role in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. Um, if we, usually, usually when we talk about big leaps in, in technology, it means that we have the biggest chunk of expenses in, in, in the way we are doing things. And then we have a significant cut on that expense, and then we actually make huge difference on the production expenses, then the price of the end product. The vertical farming technology, well, of course, the technology itself is developing maybe a, towards a little cheaper once it develops more and, and there's cheaper ways of actually doing things. Uh, the capex side, but then the the opex side, it's very difficult to actually see any huge improvements. LEDs are pretty good nowadays with the up to seventy percent efficiency ratings, so it's it's difficult to see huge leaps in LED side. Climate management, I, I think it is as good as it gets. Uh, of course, gradual minor improvements happens all the time, but but it's difficult to see any any major things there. Um, so if we are talking about this conventional ways of producing stuff, let's say conventional radical farming ways of producing stuff, then then um, I think the biggest leaps is going to come from these tens of millions of even hundreds of millions of dollars poured into this genetic development for radical farm varieties. Because if we are already reaching the genetic maximum of, of certain varieties in vertical farms, probably we never get there, but let's say closely. So then it means that the biggest leap is going to be if we can actually get that uh, energy efficiency from fibers. And so now if we, even if we get give the best possible spectrum to the plants, we still get maybe 5% efficiency from light to biomass. So we have 95% still to achieve in that perspective, but that we can only do with genetic improvement. So that's going to be probably the biggest leap in future. Yeah. And I think like what comes to leaps in technology, I think we are still, even though we have come a far way, we are still in the really initial phase of like vertical farming in general. So even with the gradual changes, like minor improvements there and there, because it's so multidisciplinary. So there's so many different parts of the system. The small changes in all of those will like make sure that the vertical farming field in general is going to like expand in all different directions. Like, of course, using AI might like offer big, big potential to optimize stuff. But like building building towards non-food like markets and medicine and all that. Like, I I think it's we're at the path that vertical farming is going to like, even though perhaps in the like calorie intake point of view it might not be in a big role in 10 years but like in general the vertical farming is going to be everywhere in in the like upcoming decades yeah now the really the speculation had on but uh, <laughs> but we re need, really need to remember what what nico said that the, the, the current plants they are selected for specific production environments mostly outdoors we've been breeding them to outdoors and so forth and we have not been pre breeding plants for specifically for vertical farming to be also so that computational biology and and, and ai uh, phase and experimental design there are a lot of new ways of, of actually try to accelerate evolution in that sense so that uh, uh, breeding better plants for specifically for vertical farming and that that's also the genetic side but also the growth environment side and, and what traits we want to uh, focus on like be it in the medical plants or nutrition values or something like that and that the plants don't need to look like for example barley or whatever we would like to put their fava bean they don't need to look like they look outside they can be bigger they can be thicker and there's no environmental stress in that sense uh, that might be a problem for some plants because they need that environmental stress but uh, yeah um, it would be really really uh, interesting to actually try to start breeding plants specifically for vertical farming but that that might be a, a really interesting avenue it's not the business yet but well i i think it's is because Syngenta, Do you? Oh, Syngenta, because Syngenta they are... and Temasek they invested 40 million dollars just in a company that is 
purely focusing on developing vertical farming. Yes, so, so let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. I think we have kind of reached our our time limit. It's not really interesting, but let's take the, some questions first. Maybe, Pasi, you can check the online questions, but we can start from the the audience if if anybody has a question. Mari. Kiitos. Uh, I'm Maria Korpi, also from Bisberg in with these guys. At I was quite interested about your presentation article. So first you had this point that you could get 30, 20 to 30% energy savings. So I guess that was the assumption that you buy directly from the grid. Yes. Then I was thinking, what if you would integrate some kind of energy storage? I guess you could even level up the savings. Mm. And, and, and quite a bit looking at the electricity price graphs that you showed. I suppose, yeah. If there is such like um, storage capacity for this kind of like uh, electricity storage, it's quite a substantive amount of electricity which needs to be stored, depending on the scale of the production facility, of course. But I'm not really like a specialist on battery technology, so and like energy storage uh, technology, so I don't really have a good take on yeah. that. I'm afraid. <laughs> Something positive still add to yeah. maybe to every everyone. I was thinking that could boost the field. Yeah. And then um, that's a question. <laughs> I have a second one for you. Let's, yeah, continue. So these graphs um, um, of the intensity versus time and quite different profiles there. Yeah. And then the end result was that there was actually no difference for the latest. Mm -hmm. Lattice, lattice. Um, but um, but then I like to find out quickly made my intercross right. It looked like the total energy delivered to the plant was the same in yes. each case. Yes. So so then maybe comes the question that what if you now start pulsating the light and and how big pulses could you make and in the end it boils down to what you were talking now that what is actually the interaction of the light with the plant and every interaction has some interaction time mm -hmm. so maybe you could switch off the light i don't know i'm just making ideas <laughs> at some point to save even more electricity or you could have a dc component and then pulsate on top of that mm. some studies on kind of like rapid pulsation of light specifically for saving electricity have been yeah. like uh, conducted already and they have gone down to like hertz level pulsation as well and that can actually also save a few percent of electricity as well but yeah. you're kind of, kind of like going into the point of my uh, study actually so we are trying to re like uh, determine what is the extent of this tolerance how much we can uh, influence the light environment, especially in terms of light intensity, without disrupt disrupting the like plant growth and development in the long term. Yeah, yeah. because I can tell you from my experience, if you just apply according to the electric price, the plants go boink. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 that, that, that yeah. Work. So there's like, some limit to yeah. it, at least. In the simplest case, you have the spectrum, like you said. But then you have also the amplitude, and then you have the frequency, not of the light, but at which you apply it. Mm -mm. And then if you vary these two, I guess you could hopefully gain like quite a lot of info to then save the energy. Yes, yes. There's also like, oh, well, we can go to the next, yeah, next yeah, question. Sorry, maybe yeah, after, yeah, maybe after the studies, we'll answer these questions. <laughs> yeah, two <laughs> roughly like answer from me. So when is my Christmas? <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Okay, I'll start with some sort of electrical engineering. I have a question, I'm maybe I missed out, but uh, have you tried different wavelengths for this light? Because I think for LED, that can be an option. And it's readily I really need visible light to, uh, I mean, to absorb things. Yeah, that's really readily ad adjustable. We have a uh, one spectrum we're currently using is uh, specified for, for like a uh, biomass production in plants like producing leafy greens basically and we have uh, 
another set of these lights, which is for with another spectrum, which is kind of like corresponding to a white light we see on the uh, with our human eyes, mm -hmm. and it's like uh, corresponding to uh, sunlight basically. So we have two different spectra we aim to try, and there's other options we can also try out. But there's also there there's options to Sorry. Was there any difference? Between... We haven't gotten to that stage yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in the future, we'll surely test out different spectra as well. Instead of lasers, that's in the <laughs> That's maybe not part of my PhD project, but maybe in the sun. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. We have a few <laughs> questions uh, online. So, one first is for Nico. Uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, question, are you running the farms or are you just co op, uh, concentrating to, to providing the technology for the farms? Uh, we are running our own farm. So we have um, about 150 square meter R&D farm in Pirkkala. So we are running that farm ourselves. Um, and we are selling the crops to, or the produce to Pirkkalan osuus, Koppa, and some, some uh, city markets. But our business itself is, is to sell technology and some ramp up operate operations for those farms. But ma the main business and the main core is, is to sell technology. Thank you. Thank you. And the second question is about the microgreens. How long do microgreens keep? How long? How long are the microgreens? Ah, all right. <laughs> our, mm, it depends on the variety of the crop. Pea microgreens are the longest, they're like 15 to 10 centimeters, but the lowest radish is less than 10 centimeters. It's like 5 to 8 centimeters, so they're quite, quite short. No more questions online? Okay, I'm Yeah, we're right on time. <laughs> quite, quite good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would like to thank everybody in the audience and in the panel and, and Peter for this, this event. And I think it was some really interesting discussion and so much so many different topics. And it really feels like we all believe that vertical farming will have an impact on the future. And and it looks like we are on the on the right right path to growing this this industry and making new applications for all kinds of, of different products. So, yeah, I think this was it, it for this event. So, yeah, thank you again. And thank you. It was really nice having you here. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>